call this meeting of the Personnel and Animal Welfare Committee to order. Uh, we have a full complement of members present. Mr. Marquise Harris Dawson, Mr. David Rue, and myself. Um, and I am going to take the items on the agenda slightly out of order. Um, so the following order will be the the uh, agenda item four, item one, two, three, six, and five. So we are going to start with item number four. Item number four, personnel department report relative to the city's targeted local hire program and related matters. And Good afternoon. Hello, and welcome to our esteemed former council member, Jackie Goldberg. Nice to see all of you. Very much. Not necessary, but on this side over here, we have a very large complement of the people who have produced the report I'm going to give to you now. As I know all of you know, because this is not our first appearance, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, but let me just remind you that since August of 2015, um, members of the personnel department and other folks uh, have been working on something called the targeted local hiring program. Um, it, by mutual agreement, uh, there was a letter uh, of agreement between the Coalition of City Unions and the City of Los Angeles that outlined the three years goals of 5,000 net new jobs. And there was, of course, Mayor Garcetti's uh, directive, Executive Directive 15 in support of the program. The group, uh, the working group, we call ourselves, uh, as opposed to the policy group, the working group uh, has eight members from the Coalition of uh, Unions, one from the mayor's office, three from council members' offices, one from the CAO, one from the CLA, one from EWDD, and one from personnel. And that's typical of management labor committees that there were eight members of each. Um, we have been working on producing city job pathways for vulnerable populations to try to make it possible for more folks who rarely ever have an opportunity to be hired by a city government in a job that has a career path that leads to the middle class and to retirement if they work their careers here. And so our task was given to us uh, by you, the council, and by the mayor's office that we try to create that path. And we now today present to you that we have done that. So first we had to identify who were the targeted people, okay? So they are as follows, the homeless and the formerly homeless, formerly incarcerated individuals, former gang members including those affected by the city's Rodriguez settlement, disconnected foster or transition age youth, veterans, local residents who live in Los Angeles city zip codes with high unemployment and incomes below medium poverty rate, including people with limited English proficiency who have enough English proficiency to take advantage of the training programs. That's a new line in this. That's the only thing new, practically, I think, that you haven't seen before. And that's, we wanted to spell out the limited English speakers as people who were targeted, but also to make it clear that if they don't speak enough and understand enough English to be able to be trained, that, that we can't go beyond that. Uh, the disabled transgendered individuals, and older workers protected by those laws uh, that protect older workers from job discrimination. Basically, the program works uh, that the person, once they get hired, is either a vocational worker or an office trainee. And if they're a vocational worker, they're mostly in the blue-collar jobs, assistant gardener, assistant tree surgeon, custodial services assistant, garage assistant, maintenance assistant and under clerical, the office trainee, which is now a position as well, has been for some time. Those folks get hired. Once they get hired by the city, they get at minimum $15 an hour and full city benefits, and they have a six-month training period. During that time, the agencies that were involved in encouraging them to join the candidate pool for this program 
also, well, most of them have agreed to be involved in supporting those candidates. And the personnel department, as well as other folks, have agreed to try to support the trainers so that they have a successful uh, opportunity if they've never trained anyone before for the jobs. After six months, they move into uh, civil service and are on probation. We consider and have come to the conclusion that if you pass the six-month training, you have, in effect, passed a civil service exam for an entry-level position. We did that because we do not want to see this program undermine civil service. It also, by the way, does not eliminate tests for these same jobs. So there will be the regular tests, but this is an alternate path. After six months of being on probation, they will be given full civil service positions, um, and uh, they will get a bump in salary. Most of them will be now making about $17 an hour, and their benefits will include. So now the big question is, how do you get into the candidate pool? Well, we developed over the period since August of 2015 an application process. They have to obtain a referral from an approved designated referral agency. Who are these? These are six of the city's 17 uh, work source centers that we have went and examined and found that they have a pretty good record of getting vulnerable populations, people in those populations, jobs. You know, some tend to cream the crop. I don't mean to be negative about anybody, but that's true. And these six don't. And who are they? They're El Proyecto del Barrio in the valley. Their goodwill uh, for uh, starting with the uh, east side and going further east. Their uh, Jewish vocational services for the west side. Their PACE, uh, Pacific uh, Asian uh, group uh, for central LA. Uh, Pacific Gateway for the harbor area and uh, the uh, UAW Work Source Center. Uh, their two locations for south LA. The candidate intake uh, assesses job readiness, reviews job pathways, completes and submits a referral form that will be identical no matter where the candidate comes into the system, and refers the candidate to an application site. This could be uh, any group. It doesn't have to be a work source center. It could be a LAUSD career and ed, could be a high school career counselor, could be uh, community colleges, could be uh, any one of uh, uh, basically uh, a, a huge number of um, community-based organizations, and I'm not going to read them to you, but that's the list we have visited in person so far, and we're still doing that. We're meeting with them. We asked, as you know, each and every one of you to give us referrals if we might have missed somebody in your community that we didn't know about. And that process, by the way, will continue. Once they get into the candidate pool, 80% of them, of when at the personnel department receives a request for any of these six positions uh, to send us candidates, we will draw randomly 80% of them from what we're calling Tier 1, which is the targeted group, and 20% from Tier 2, which is not the targeted group. So in other words, let's say you live in Inglewood or you live in Compton. You don't, it's not zero chance. It's just less chance. You're not in the targeted local hiring group. But you're still going to have a 20% chance of having your name drawn to go for an interview with a department. So once this all happens and the selection department is done, we've eliminated the box, so there will be no <coughs> questions about their... Um, possible incarcerations, but they are a targeted group. So after they get offered a job by a department, then a thumbprint will be taken. We are working with each department on protocols because there are different positions that have different requirements. So for example, a person who may have been involved years ago in a burglary or whatever, some kind of crime of finance, but who's going to do curb cuts, probably not relevant if they have a good record since that time. So it's going to be on an individual basis, and it will be based on what are the job requirements. Obviously, rec and parks, for example, around children, we're going to have a higher standard than if you're out cutting trees, doing curb cuts in terms of these issues. Uh, so there will be a background review. 
We want the designated referral agencies, in addition to job readiness and assessment, to do supportive services, to do ongoing development, and to make sure that we have an opportunity to uh, work on all of this with them so that we can try to have the highest success rate. Right now, today, uh, the airport has already hired 20 uh, office trainees um, uh, and is working on that. There are several other departments, including sanitation, street services, I think that's all right now, personnel. and personnel that have begun to hire some folks. We will have a soft launch in January. The soft launch will be with community-based organizations and those six work source centers that already have a relationship with a department. So for example, uh, Trade Tech has a relationship with some departments and has for years, uh, particularly in public works. They will have a soft launch. That means that their candidates that they've identified and say that they are ready, job ready right now, are able to go into the candidate pool. In March, we will open it up to Again, another soft launch, meaning not public brouhaha, yay, yippee do, uh, but just uh, a, a, another launch, which will be for all the community-based organizations that we have met with and that the personnel department staff has gone out and certified that what they're doing does, in fact, guarantee that they've done preparation with that person for taking advantage of one of these jobs. Um, and then on July 1st, because this is year zero, as it is in the MOU, or the LOA, I guess they call them now. Uh, this is year zero. Year one will be July 1st, 2017. That will be a formal public launch saying to everybody who is any of these categories, this is a good time for you to do it. The personnel department has reduced the application. If you've seen the city's application, it is many pages and many folds to just two pages. We only ask people who you are and where you are, what you're interested, who's referring you, which of these six positions you're interested in, whether or not you can work nights and weekends, whether or not you want to do physical labor or be indoors. And I think we ask them what part of the city are they willing to work in everywhere, or maybe if I live in the harbor, I may only want to go up as far as the 10 freeway, whatever. <laughs> and that's the whole application. There is a space for them to tell us what other kinds of things and skills they know already. But remember, as training programs, there are no skill requirements. The only real requirements are you have to be legally able to work in the United States, and you have to understand and speak enough English to take advantage of the training programs. That's it. And we think that because of the large number of people in the civilian workforce that are ready to retire uh, in the next several years, that not only will this work for the immediate LOA program, but it may become a permanent part of the city's hiring process for um, really basic beginning jobs. And so that's our report. I want to say to you before you ask any questions or comments that I have never worked with a group of people that have worked harder or been more dedicated than the people from the personnel department and all of the people who have been on the, the committee uh, to do it. There were many places we could have come to loggerheads and things could have slowed down or dis disintegrated and none of it did. People went on subcommittees, people went on meetings, people have traveled all over the city with me to meet with community-based organizations. We've had report after report written by these folks here, led by Vincent Cordero. Everybody has really put a lot of effort and energy and commitment to this program, and so I want to tell you it's been a pleasure for me to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Well, this, is, this sounds like an outstanding program. It seems like everything's coming together, so... I commend you and everyone that's worked on this for getting us to this point. Um, I know we've started softly and gently. How, have we, do we actually have a number on how many people we've hired so far through this program? It's probably under 30. Right, which is not surprising because we're just beginning the first yeah, baby that's steps. Right. But and also just the uh, Vincent Cordero Personnel Department, all the departments we surveyed, all of them that have these classifications are interested in participating. So I think, it, as Jackie mentioned, it's going to continue to grow. I think the thing that everybody's waiting for 
as near as I can tell as I talk to people in various departments, is for job identification slots, slots that say, yes, you can hire these people. Uh, so some of them have some vacancies because they're already in the budget. Others say I'd hire them right now, but I don't have any authority right now to hire in my department. So some of it is everybody's kind of waiting to see, well, what's the next year's budget going to look like? What could we do right now? Do I, should I go to an existing list if it exists? I'm thinking, for example, the uh, tree, assistant tree surgeon, there's a list. Should I go to that civil service list or should I hire from the local targeted local hiring program? So there's a bit of kind of I'm not sure which path to take yet. Uh, but we believe uh, if we're lucky by June 30th of 2017, year zero, we hope to have maybe a couple of hundred hires under this program, but we have no way of really knowing, to be honest with you. The, the leaders have been the uh, uh, airport. They uh, also said already that they're going to probably hire 20 more vocational workers this year, this fiscal year, uh, and uh, sanitation and pub, uh, uh, in public works and um, uh, street services are both saying, yeah, we got positions to fill. You've got other folks like in sanitation saying, well, I can never seem to get enough people trained before the other ones leave, and, and so how do we do that? So there are issues that are still here, uh, but we think that between now and June 30th, we're going to have experiences that will let us refine and, you know, refine the program and tweak it a little here and there where we're not making, uh, making progress that we want. We also will be coming back to you periodically, as has been required, to say how many people have been hired. Um, so we're hoping that in January, February, and March, we'll begin to see some hiring toward that goal of maybe 200 uh, in year zero. And, and hopefully, once we budget for it more adequately, this is uh, come our, July 1st, this should really take off. This is our plea. That's why, and that's why with a couple of hundred, if we could actually get a couple of hundred hires, we will have enough experience with enough departments to know what's working and what's not. So it's actually probably not terrible that there aren't massive jobs. Our next big question will be, suppose 20,000 people <laughs> sign up for the candidate pool. Then you get into a situation where you have as much chance of getting a Section 8 voucher as you do of getting called for a job. And we don't want that to happen. So one of the tasks we're going to have to take on fairly soon is are we going to limit the number of candidates that can go into the pool? Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe never, I don't know. So we have other questions is what I'm trying to say, but we have enough done and we've met with enough people, including repeatedly with our six application work source centers, that we believe it is a good time to have a soft launch and to see what the problems are and to try to figure out how to fix them before July 1st of 17. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, questions? Mr. Harris Dawson? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Rue, for taking this item out of order uh, as I've got to go. And this is something that's super, super important to us. Uh, a big part of the story we were trying to tell when we uh, ran and we started uh, working with you the minute uh, we got in, uh, sworn in uh, to the City Council. Uh, so we're very excited. Uh, personnel and the, and the committee has worked very closely with our, our staff in CD8, so we've been able to track it, uh, help get organizations involved. Uh, the role of uh, uh, the labor movement in this has been Fabulous. Uh, right on point, uh, so we couldn't uh, be prouder of that. I think uh, it's exactly right that starting with a small number makes a lot of sense, uh, so we get to see what works and what doesn't work, because we want in addition to this program to be popular with local workers, we want it to be popular with managers oh, and so supervisors. Oh, so do we. So do we. Uh, we want them, the decisions. Right, exactly. So we want them clamoring uh, to get at these candidates. And so uh, we think uh, you all have handled it in exactly the right way. I think um, our chairperson points out some very key questions. I think those are all good questions and good problems to have uh, at this stage of a, a process. So uh, we're just very, very grateful. And, and uh, you know, lastly, I, I am um, remind. I was reminded while I was listening to the councilwoman present uh, of being a very, very young uh, organizer uh, with a bit of chip on my shoulder. 
uh, organizing around welfare to work jobs there you uh, go. with the chair of the personnel department of the LA City Council uh, trying to do frankly then exactly what we're doing now uh, and so it's nice to come full circle and be in the room with uh, 721 and the personnel department and 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 and, 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 me and, and you OE and all uh, and all the organizations, yeah, everybody's still, it's, it's like, uh, it's like getting the band back together. So, <laughs> um, um, and so I'm, I'm happy to have grown up and gotten a job. So, <laughs> um, uh, it's good to see you and, uh, we appreciate everybody that's been a part of this so far. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, thank you. And I concur. I'm just so happy and excited that I got to be part of this. And, um, and I know, uh, we're starting off slow, but you know, especially with 47% of our entire workforce, um, uh, eligible for retirement in the next two years. What you're doing is just so, so invaluable. Um, and even though we have hired about 2030, our end goal is, what, what is it, 5,000, right? Or well, but all of them are not entry-level positions. Right, right. So what we're thinking is, is that as those that are not entry-level positions get filled, mm -hmm. they will be filled by existing entry-level workers. Mm -hmm. Right. Opening up more entry-level positions. So we think that as those positions get filled, uh, we will even see a greater numbers possible for mm -hmm. higher in the entry level. Uh, my guess from just estimating, looking at what departments have told us so far, it's probably about 20% of the 5,000 mm -hmm. that uh, should come forth in the next couple of years mm -hmm. as entry level positions. And then right. you see as people promote, as people retire, there'll be movement in the system which will backfill with entry-level positions. And, and, I'm, and I'm just so happy that in our previous actions um, we're trying to hire uh, 5,000 new employees and, and instead of just talking about it, this is the actual um, nuts and bolts of how we're going to start to get to that number. And um, so I'm very excited to be a part of this. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, a very good day. And this is a very important endeavor in the coalition that have come together and led by you, uh, former Councilmember uh, Jackie Goldberg. I, I feel rest assured, and I am so happy that you're at the helm of this. Um, and I look forward to continued reports. Um, just let us know how and what we could do um, to support in this endeavor. Um, and, and I mean, um, we're just starting. I mean, <laughs> we got to do other things. But once we get once we get them here, we got to also think about continuing education. Um, cross training. We've actually right? worked Motion. with LAUSD already right. yeah. about restoring the, you know, I was on the school board in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> Tells you how long ago I've been doing this. Uh, but we had at that time in the career in adult education, we had working with the personnel department promotion training classes. Mm -hmm. uh, they've agreed to do them again. Great. So we're working with them to have the personnel department help them design. Once you're in one of these six positions, you've been there a year, maybe there'll be an opportunity to promote. And we hope that we do not want to hire people to stay in entry mm -hmm. level positions. That is not the goal of this program. The goal of this program is entry into the middle class and a permanent committed city workforce that believes in the city of Los Angeles. That, right. Those are our goals. Right. And I'm just going to lastly say, um, having worked for a homeless, uh, uh, a mental health um, hospital and a homeless provider and a homeless field for about 12 years, um, the number one thing to prevent homelessness is more than medication, counseling, treatment, um, housing is a job. Absolutely. So this is, um, um, I mean, we're tackling homelessness. And we, we got the chair of uh, the Homeless Committee here as well. But I see this as um, us doing multiple things. So and there may so be much. an opportunity for us to ask you to provide some funding from the homeless initiatives. <laughs> <laughs> I never miss this opportunity. Yeah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> to kind of connect some of the dots that might not connect for homeless people. You know, right. it's a lot right. harder. And certainly as we put contracts out to bid to construct housing and to do all that, it's an opportunity for us to plug them into this program, especially if it's up and running. And let me say another exciting thing that is happening. The building trades and OE, the operating engineers, are both in the process of developing an apprenticeship program within the city of Los Angeles. Nice. City Hall. So this, is, this will be a new opportunity. They won't have to go outside somewhere else and get training to be for these positions. We will train them in-house. Um, so we're, we're all pretty excited about this. This has been quite an exciting time for all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Goldberg, for all your great work. And we have a couple of speakers from the public, and then we will finish up with this item. The first is Puppet.
who I think is really Mr. Wayne Spindler. And start the time now, please. Thank you. This is a good thing. And we got the only two councilmen I trust. And that's why the one on the left and the one on the right give them 100% ownership of this project. And Jackie Goldberg, and it'll work. But if you give it to the one in the middle, <coughs> so again, yes, continue. Also consider hiring people with no immigration status. Yay! And then we'll show that to Donald Trump, and Donald Trump will seize up. So that would be something to consider. <laughs> so this woman here, he's the puppet, thinks is one of the best people in the city. And that's why you put her up first to try to calm me down, and it worked, yes. <laughs> so happy holidays. Thank you. Excellent project. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis Doherty. Good afternoon, Phyllis Doherty. I'm here as a taxpayer and a former city employee. Uh, the, the, this list was in a, uh, the wrong order. Why is it that veterans, the disabled, the elderly, or those who were not even mentioned, minority youth or minorities of any age who seek to work and who have lived responsible lives are left off of this list? The, as a city employee, you have a fiduciary responsibility to every person in this city. You have a badge that enables you to get into properties where there are children, where there are families that trust that the city is sending someone who has acted responsibly and will continue to do so. The city is not a charity. If you want to fund charity organizations to do this kind of thing, do the training and then provide th those names to the city, that's great. But the city, we're not, we don't pay our taxes for this. We pay our taxes for you to keep us straight to keep us safe. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Uh, and so uh, on this item, we will note, note and file the report without may I, objection. May I just make a brief comment, though, on this? Uh, uh, okay. Brief, yes. Brief, very brief. Local residents and zip codes with high unemployment and incomes below the median poverty rate, unfortunately, because of the racial segregation of housing patterns in this city, means that they are primarily people of color. So if she was worried that they weren't included, they are. And veterans are included as well in, in foster in, care. In many of the other categories. In many yeah. of the other categories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking this out of order. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Uh, next item is uh, item number one. Okay. Item number one, Department of Animal Services, to give a presentation in regard to the small animal response teams. And by the way, for the record, for folks in the audience, uh, uh, this meeting has to end as f at four, so we'll do as much business as we've gotten to by then. Okay, we'll, we'll Thank be, you, Ms. Barnett. We'll be quick. Thank you very much. We're, we're, very, we're pleased to uh, present a report to this committee about the specialized mobile animal rescue team, SMART, for the department. I'll just give you a little history, and then um, I brought the people who can answer any questions that you might have. Uh, in February 2012, the department consolidated its small animal rescue team, um, the department air rescue team, and the wildlife program into one special operations unit. The department further unified the small animal rescue team, SMART, and the department air rescue team, DART. Uh, and what we were trying to do was get people with specialized training into a unit so that they could work together and uh, take advantage of each other's skills and training uh, to provide better services during rescues. 
Uh, currently, with the exemption of one smart lead and one other officer, the members are all deployed throughout the city and perform regular animal control duties unless they are called to assist with an emergency rescue. This is very much like the fire department. The fire department has swift water rescue, but the people are firemen unless they're called out to do swift water rescue. The SMART team has a 100% save rate since they began using their specialized training, experience, and knowledge for rescuing small and large animals in distress. Those are domestic and wild. Uh, the Special Operations Unit, including the SMART team, is under the command of Interim Assistant General Manager Louis Dado to my left and is being led by Officer Armando Navarrete to my right and with a, a lot of help from uh, Lieutenant uh, Annette Ramirez further to his right. Um, the SMART team was created because there was a demand for a team dedicated to rescuing animals stuck in extreme situations. SMART will rescue any type of animal, whether it's stray, wild, or owned. SMART will respond 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When an animal is in distress, you call your local animal shelter and the officer on duty will assess the situation and call SMART if the rescue requires the skills and equipment that only the SMART team can deliver. Members of, the SMART, members of SMART combine their passion for rescuing animals and their recreational knowledge and experience of rock climbing, swift water rescue, and rappelling. They created a number of acronyms um, uh, M-A-R-T-E for Mock Animal for Rescue Training Exercises, MARS, M-A-R-S, Mock Animal Rescue Scenario, uh, RAC, R-A-K, Ropes, Anchors, and Knots, and I don't know how you say this one, P-O-L-R, Pools, Oceans, Lakes, and Rivers. That sort of gives you an idea of where all they can go. They can go in the water, they can go high, they can go low. Uh, they, they're trained on a, just an amazing number of things that they can use to help our animals when they're in distress. Um, the SMART is also a National Fire Protection Agency certified. Uh, they can perform swift water rescue operations across the country. In July and November of 2009, SMART went through swift water rescue training and has made uh, modifications for the rescue training geared towards rescuing uh, They've taken the, the equipment that's used for humans and modified it so they can use it to save animals. It's not as easier to say that than to read what I wrote. Uh, SMART also has a registered veterinary technician on the team, recognizing the need to have a medic available to, at rescues to provide emergency medical care and ensure the animal is stable prior to transport. The RVT undergoes the same specialized training, making him or her capable of treating an animal stuck in any type of extreme situation. Seven SMART members are NFPA certified in low angle rope rescue operations. Uh, in addition to the training curriculum that SMART created, they saw a need to be able to understand and be efficient with the training that the fire departments and mountain search and rescue teams adhere to across the nation. During uh, the 2015-16 fiscal year, uh, SMART successfully completed approximately 164 rescues. In, in your report, I broke down the number per animal. Um, it included birds, cats, coyotes, deer, dogs, horses, llama, opossum, pig, raccoon, skunk, and squirrels. During so far year to date in this fiscal year, SMART has successfully completed 90 rescues also including birds, a bobcat, cats, deer, dogs, horses, an iguana, a llama, raccoons, a snake, and a squirrel. <laughs> so they don't have too many limits. Um, the department is proud of the SMART team and has worked to support their special trainings as well as the purchase and updated and appropriate equipment to make their sometimes dangerous work as safe as possible. The department also took advantage of an opportunity to obtain some older vehicles from city fleet services that can be used to store and move their specialized equipment from rescue to rescue. The Board of Animal Services Commissioners also helped SMART obtain some specialized equipment through the Animal Welfare Trust Fund available in our budget. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to update you on SMART and um, offer these people to answer questions. Well, thank you. And this, this uh Clearly, is a great program, and uh, I, I commend the department for uh, continuing to, to work it as you have. 
Um, now, there have been rumors that the SMART team is at risk of being disbanded. What's the status of, te of the team, and is there even a kernel of truth to that possibility? No, I'll take that one. There's not a kernel of truth. Not sure where the rumor came from. The first thing that I saw was a press release that came from a, the company, the production company, for the uh, video that's out about the SMART team. Uh, when I contacted them and said, where did you get this? untrue information. They declined to tell me their sources, so I don't know where the information came from, but it is absolutely inaccurate. Now, the members of the SMART team, my understanding is that most of them do ACO duties when they're not actively involved in, in these kinds of rescues. Uh, is that correct? Does everybody do other ACO duties? Are there some that just work on SMART? How does it work? There, there are two that just work on SMART, but like uh, Lieutenant Ramirez has a full plate, uh, and we just have to sneak her away sometimes for rescues. <laughs> Is your plate full? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but uh, so most of them do other work in the meantime. Yeah, and, and it, it's couple. like the fire department. They're stationed in the shelters. They're doing regular animal control officer work, and when there's a rescue, they're called out just like the fire department does for swift water. Yeah, and you mentioned special equipment. How, what kind of special equipment, and how do they access it? Uh, NAV. <laughs> Hi, Armando Navred, animal control officer and team leader for the SMART team. Specialized equipment is, mirrors that of any search and rescue, whether it be mountain or fire. It can consist of um, gurneys for humans, but we use them for animals. Ropes that are especially used for specific uh, rescue types, for example, uh, if it's one person or two people. For us, it's a person and an animal. Also, harnesses are specially designed so that we don't fall out of them if we turn upside down. The pulleys, carabiners, um, the um, type of water for swift water are, are type 5 personal flotation devices, special suits to protect us from the cold and from the elements that are, or the contamination factor of the man-made lakes we have in Los Angeles. They look pretty, but they're not very clean. So we have the exact same equipment, and it costs the exact same amount as any fire department specialized team. Um, we have had to modify some equipment because it doesn't exist, and because animals equipment isn't rated for say, for, for example, for humans you have to have a rating system that will keep it, uh, the person safe. Animals do not, but that doesn't limit us from getting the equipment that is rated and converting it for animal rescue so we keep the animal, which is our victim, safe in every operation. And how, do, how is the SMART team funded? Is it funded out of the department? or outside fundraising, or a combination of the two? How does it work? Well, for the last few years, we have put um, SMART in the, in the budget so that they could upgrade supplies. One of the things, when I first got here, they were providing their own ropes, and some of them were pretty frayed and not very safe, so we decided it was time to uh, actually include them as part of the budget. Uh, I think the, some of the transport vehicles, correct me if I'm wrong, Nav, uh, were um, older vehicles with fleet services that we upgraded. Uh, they're wrapped with design. Actually, they're kind of fun to tour. I've toured them before because they have all their equipment wrapped up and very neat, just ready to roll out to a rescue and grab whatever they need and go to it. So, so the equipment's in better condition than when, than when we first started this program. I sure hope so. <laughs> it's it's a hundred percent better. We used to buy our equipment at Home Depot, and the rope that you wouldn't even use to make a clothesline, we used to use that because we had no knowledge. Once we experienced the knowledge, we went to General Manager Barnett and said we need to get the right rope to be safe, to minimize the risk in these rescue operations that are desperately needed throughout the city. And it took a while for us to get the right vendors because. You have to get the right rope for when you want to hang someone 120 feet over a building, and we now have that, and we maintain it. Uh, the person that's stationed with me, his sole, one of his other duties is to inventory and inspect the equipment on a daily basis. We rescue about every other day. We get backed up, so it's he and I that have to uh, inspect the many miles of rope of, uh, of, that we have in our caches, including the hardware and the equipment and the vehicles. So it's never like we're sitting around just... Uh, waiting for a call. We are actually active almost every day. Very good. Mr. Rue, any further questions or comments? Um, if not, uh, uh, we will, uh, I guess we'll just note and file this report. And Thanks thank for the for opportunity to brag oh, about the smart. Excuse me, I, I, I did miss the fact that we have a couple speakers from the public. Oh.
uh, before, so uh, let us hear from Phyllis Doherty and then uh, Wayne Spindler. Phyllis Doherty with Animal Issues Movement. Um, certainly it's wonderful to have people that have the time to go out and rescue uh, squirrels and uh, snakes and, and things like this, but our animal control officers have done that forever. They do it very competently, and they're out there also dealing with pit bulls, attacks on people, it's making people safe, and they have uh, trucks that are still 15 years old, have over 150,000 miles. The SMART team just got a $76,000 one van that does not carry animals. I got all of the CPRA. And they take off at any time they want to. They are not first responders in, in the same sense as the fire department. They cannot go code three. They have to observe all of the traffic and parking laws of everyone else. So the emergency, uh, community does not consider them to be first responders. It's fine for them to do this, but they need to be spending their time basically out in the field, keeping people safe from all the, the harms. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Mr. Spindler. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, this is great, especially about saving bigger animals than just dogs and cats, but scorpions? And snakes, ew. So I just think that we should limit it to the larger animals, like bobcats. I like bobcats. Bobcats are neat. And bobcats are Paul Koretz's favorite animal because he saved more bobcats than anyone in America. Let's give him a hand. So you should take the bobcats on a ride and provide another $200,000 for a special transport vehicle just to save bobcats. Because I like them. They have nice tails and they eat lots of vegetation, but they never hurt me a bull. So I like my fellow bobcats. So thank you, support the item. Thank you, and I guess actually uh, there's no need to receive and file this since it's a discussion item. So that's correct. We will move on to item number two. Item number two: CAO report relative to proposed management contract with Best Friends Animal Society for the operation of the Northeast Valley Animal Shelter for a term of three years with three one-year renewal options. Good afternoon. My name is Felicia Orozco with the Office of the CAO. Before you is a report requesting authority for, for the Department of Animal Services with the assistance of the CAO and the city attorney to negotiate and execute a management contract with Best Friends Animal Society for the operation of the Northeast Valley Animal Shelter, located in Council District 7 for the term of three years with three one-year renewal options. Best Friends has been providing programs and services at the Northeast Valley for nearly five years and its contract expires December 31st, 2016. Under the terms of the current contract, Best Friends provides the city with on-site adoptions and monthly adoption events, low-cost spay neuter surgeries, vaccinations, and medical care for the public and shelter animals, and educational outreach and development programs. The partnership with Best Friends has enhanced the range of services provided at the Northeast Valley to the benefit of all city residents at a limited cost to the city and reduced the number of animals euthanized due to time and space constraints. The terms of the proposed contract are essentially consistent with the current agreement. However, the proposed contract includes new provisions that allow Best Friends to the option to enter into a sub-agreement with a nonprofit animal welfare organization to provide spay and neuter surgeries and to accept vent vouchers issued to Los Angeles residents by the department for spay or neuter surgeries. The General Services Department will continue to, to provide basic facility maintenance and utilities for the Northeast Valley and will pay for all due charges up to 200,000 annually. If the city continues to contract out Northeast Valley operations, the city would be afforded approximately 3.8 million in services. There is no general fund impact, and it is now recommended that a new contract with Best Friends Animal Society be approved for the operation of Northeast Valley Shelter. Uh, the department staff is also here for any questions. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, so did the city audit the services provided by Best Friends uh, from 2012 through 2016? Correct. And uh, are they compliant with uh, all of our requirements of them? And w what in general was the result of the audit? Yes, they've um, complied with all city requirements. We ask that they um, house approximately 100 animals um, for adoptions on a daily basis, as well as 3,000 uh, adoptions um, from the department. Uh, they receive 3,000 animals from the department for adoptions annually, as well as 6,000 uh, spay-neuter surgeries from the public and shelter animals. They have actually performed beyond our dreams and expectations. Okay. And also, uh, there are allegations floating around, although I don't have any credible documentation of them, um, that there may be direct intake of animals at that shelter, um, which they're not supposed to be doing. Uh, I've seen nothing resembling credible proof, um, but I have seen a document with some handwritten intake numbers on it uh, with a type list of kittens. So I don't know if that means anything to you, if we've run across uh, this problem and actually have concerns. We, we have been working with, um, the inter with some intervention rescue groups at three of our shelters who um, book the kittens in and to us, but then they sometimes let the people continue to take care of them as foster families. So if, if you've seen anything, it would be like that, but all of the animals are first booked into our system. Uh, before best friends can have them. Uh, and if somebody just happens to go to their door, they usually either bring them to one of our shelters, we go pick them up, or we just n get them entered into the system so that everybody has an A number. The, the reason the contract with best friends was set up the way it was, requiring them to take only animals from the city shelters, was because we wanted to have a complete inventory of all animals that are under the care of the city in any manner, whether it was directly in one of our six shelters or in the Best Friends operated shelter at Northeast. Now the CEO, uh, CAO provides a summary estimate of $3.8 million to operate this, the facility. Um, we obviously started this because uh, at the time we were broke and looking at shutting down the shelter. Um, would there be a benefit to the city in taking that shelter over? And uh, what would happen to that 3.8 million in the animal services system? Is there, what would the trade-off be and would it ever be worth it to do that? Well, would it ever, I, I don't think I want to go to the ever well, <laughs> role. Currently, but, but currently, but currently I think it. it would cost us more than 3.8 million to operate that shelter. Uh, I think 3.8 is probably a uh, very accurate number that the CAA's office came up with, but when you start adding things to it, it might even be more than that. So uh, it, it would be a total trade-off. I feel that the marketing advantage that we get partnering with Best Friends, the way they promote things that include us in their promotions, is a benefit that we probably couldn't afford or couldn't match in any way. There are a number of times that they actually underwrite some of our adoption fees and help us with adoption fees so that the entire city can perform better for holiday weekends or something like that. And that would be over and above the 3.8. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Rue, any other comments or questions? If not, uh, I would recommend that we approve the CAO's recommendation. And But before that, again, I realize I have speakers from the public. Um, Mr. Spindler to be followed by Ms. Doherty and Mr. Dan Gus. Go ahead, you're an animal. No, you go ahead. Okay. Yes, uh, I noticed that this, uh, I think the organization is a nonprofit, and I'm hearing reports in the, life, the last four years they were making over a quarter billion dollars of this uh, income. So this is a large, large company. I'm just wondering if, the, if they have so many operations, how much personal touch are they going to give to this shelter because it's just, this is such a large mega entity with that kind of a budget. 
I don't want this to be taken over neglected or put down the pike as, as a subdivision. I want this shelter to become a top-notch shelter because I got a dog years ago from the shelter and the place was, was ran very well on a low budget and we got good animals. So whatever you do, let's bring this thing up to speed and make it a shining example. Thank you. Ms. Doherty. Phyllis Doherty with Animal Issues Movement. Um, thank you, Mr. Kretz, for bringing up the fact that this is a city shelter badly needed. If you can remember the pleas of Richard Alarcon for this community, and because it's a low-income community and it's not organized as well, they are left without officers and without a shelter to serve them. And the, the premise upon which we voted for Prop F, $154 million in bonds as taxpayers, the main selling point was we need another shelter in the valley. This will provide it. If you want to see the document, I can show you. That was a lie to the city because it was never intended to be funded. Best Friends is, uh, last night, uh, Mark Peralta said, we will not subsidize programs that we do with the city. He was very clear, we will not subsidize the city. And at the commissioners asking if there was identity on there to show this is a city shelter, his answer was, well, you've got a uh, label on the door. That was it. Thank you. Daniel Gus, um, very clearly, if you approve this, I am going to have half of my spring articles for City Watch LA and the KFI Sunday Morning News on this subject about Mr. Kretz's fiscal incompetence and mismanagement. The other half that you want to see, this is the impound card. For those handwritten impound animals, there's no microchip, there's no photo, there's no inoculations. If those animals were actually belonging to the city, you can't have them call in and then give them an A number. This is the other half of the credible information that you're missing. If you approve this, I'm going to write a series of articles with Jesse Creed and former city controller Laura Chick showing that you are mismanaging this. Furthermore, Best Friends from 2009 to 2013 took in $259 million. Yesterday, you guys had to approve loans for your LAPD uh, settlements. These people have the money. You're giving away a city asset. You cannot do this. You'll pay the price if you do. Ms. Bardet, would you like to come up and respond to any of that? The, when I uh, was hired um, and we were sitting in the budget meetings, um, Northeast Mission was not in operation and was not uh, expected to be in operation for the next year uh, because of the budget deficit. Um, there was no money to operate the shelter. We had only used it as a storage for some evidence animals and some underage kittens. It was never open, it was never operated as an adoption agency by the city. Uh, during the discussions, um, there was some concern, I remember by Council Member Alarcon, about um, whether or not there would be an officer there. But if you look at the location of West Valley and East Valley, they make a nice little triangle. So there are uh, officers who, ser who provide services to those areas. I believe that what um, Best Friends has offered the community is an opportunity to volunteer. They have been doing spay and neuter out of their facilities free for that community. Uh, they've provided a lot of services for that community. Perhaps we have not documented it as well as we could, but I think it's a very responsible thing for us to have a public-private partnership that allows us to save more animals' lives and provide more services to the people in that part of the community. Thank you. Well, again, if there's no objections, uh, I would suggest that we approve the CAO's recommendation for this item. Item number three. Item three, motion corrects a fair relative to instructing the Department of Animal Services to report in regard to specialized facilities and services provided to animals besides cats and dogs housed at the city's animal shelters and related matters. Help. 
And this is a, this is a motion that uh, I put forward after a, a visit to one of the shelters. And uh, I noticed that we don't do much, at least in this particular shelter, and I haven't visited them all with an eye towards this, of letting people know where animals other than dogs and cats are. And this particular shelter um, had some rabbit cages. I think they were covered from the wind by some, some uh, hanging protections, but they were also completely hidden from view. Mm -hmm. So if you went by and you weren't necessarily looking for a rabbit, but you might have been uh, possibly enticed into having one if you saw some cute rabbits, well, you would have no idea that you were standing three feet away from the rabbit section. Mm -hmm. So uh, my suggestions are that we look at this situation in every shelter in our system and look at whether there are, are ways to feature them more, make them more adoptable. Um, in this particular case, it could have taken a, a sign maker just to write the word bunnies on the outside of this canvas that was hiding them. and. Uh, you know, many people might access them. So want to see what your thoughts were about reviewing the signage at shelters and how internally we might provide more wayfinding to these animals and whether there are ways to uh, change the layout and location at shelters and whether there are things we could be doing to, to market beyond just the dogs and cats as much as we all love them if we have other animals in the shelters people should know and we should make an effort to adopt them as well. Now, I think it's a very good idea for us to review. I think if nothing else, we come back and we present a public report that lets people know a little bit more how we do uh, display the animals, how you can find them. There are a lot of things that we do that I think um, sometimes go unnoticed. For example, we just changed the uh, formula of the ration for the rabbits to a higher quality pet food. That's probably the kind of thing that nobody really knows about, but it was very important for the rabbits. Um, I think as far as uh, the shelter I believe you were visiting was north, and we are in the process of trying to move the bunnies into a room. We have a delay in the cages that we've ordered that seems painfully long to us, but we're sure we're going to work through that and that, the, that they will eventually arrive. But you know, we should look at everything. There's, we should always be reviewing and always trying to do better, so we're happy to prepare a report for you. What's the timeline of uh, when you can get back to us on that? Uh -huh. That's why I brought help. Yeah. <laughs> may I have a mass sidebar? Okay, can you do it? In six, do you think you can do it in 60 days? Of course, absolutely. I mean, because uh, it doesn't, wherever we are, you know, in those 60 days, we'll be prepared to report. I mean, hopefully the vendor issue that we're having with the purchase of the cages for the North Central Shelter will be uh, uh, taken care of by then, but uh, whatever point, at whatever point we're at in 60 days, we'll, we're happy to report on that. That would be great. Thank you. So we'll, we'll hold this item at committee and ask for you to report back in 60 days. And uh, let's see. I feel like I have a card for this one. I do. Mr. Spindler, would you like to? Oh, okay, we will. We'll, thank you. We will move on to item number six. Item number six, continue from August 3rd, 2016. Personnel Department report in response to adopted budget recommendation relative to instructing the Personnel Department to report in regard to true systematic uses of volunteers. Good afternoon, Brandy Harris, Personnel Department. Uh, the Personnel Department was requested to report back on the department's volunteer usage. And on August 29, 2016, an email was sent to each personnel director from every city department asking the following questions in regards to fiscal year 14-15 and 15-16. Number one, how many volunteers have worked in your department? Number two, how many hours of work did the volunteers complete during that time? Number three, please list the duties performed by the volunteers. A total number of 14 departments responded with the number of hours and duties performed by their volunteers. A total number of 19 departments responded with the statement of their department not utilizing volunteers at the time in question. And a total number of six departments did not respond at all. All the departments that reported volunteer uses provided a description of their duties. 
uh, that the volunteers performed for our records. And based off the department's responses, the personnel department found most departments are utilizing their volunteers in the following areas, to name a few. Administrative support, clerical, research, data input, filing, system support, record retention, data collection. Some departments uh, have volunteer duties very specific to their department's functions that were not listed in the previous bullets, i.e. animal services, recreation and park, zoo, et cetera. Overall, fiscal year 14-15, there were approximately 44,700 volunteers utilized through all city departments with approximately 260,000 volunteer hours worked. And overall, fiscal year 15-16, there were approximately 40, 48,500 volunteers utilized throughout all city departments with approximately 280,000 volunteer hours worked. Thank you. Um, I know the mayor's office has a, a volunteer core group, and I know council offices do. Um, did the, cert, the survey include the mayor's office and council office volunteers, or is this just other departments? It included 40 departments, and the mayor and council office was not included in this survey. So perhaps in a future survey, we should include those also. Okay. We'll and uh, is there a formal structure identifying which departments coordinate volunteer services for the city? Uh, if somebody wants to volunteer for the city, what's the, what's the best entry point for them? As in how are they recruiting their volunteers? Yeah, well, let, let's say you are a person out in the community and you want to generically volunteer for the city. What's, are you best to call your council office, call the mayor's office, call some other department? What's, what's the best entry point, or have we figured that out yet? We need to look into that, so we'll work with your offices to look into how we, the best entry point. But as far as we know, there is no central point. It's a case by case by each department. So. Okay, well it seems like that would be an, an ideal, uh, because I think there are a fair number of people that want to help and they just don't know where to go and they probably wander around in the city system uh, you know and maybe never figure out uh, how to actually get involved um is there any potential liability from hiring volunteers uh, and if so is there any kind kind of standardized waiver form or anything like that so that question wasn't asked and we'd be willing to work with you to you know, flesh, flesh that out a little bit more in terms of liabilities. So we would have to look into that more and report back to you on that particular item. Okay, and I have a couple animal services uh, uh, questions as well. Just the, does the department have a standardized set of guidelines and details uh, in terms of how we deal with volunteers and do we deal the same with everybody, or do we treat people that want to play with cats uh, and socialize them differently from people that want to walk dogs? Uh, how does this work? Well, the orientation to become a volunteer is standardized, uh, and you can go to an orientation at any shelter, any of the six shelters, and then go to a different one to actually volunteer. Once you've gotten through the volunteer orientation and the background and become a volunteer, then the training is supplied at each shelter according to your area of that you prefer. We used to require people to, to clean cats for so many hours before they did anything else, and uh, we stopped doing that due to allergies and preferences. But if you come in and you want to walk dogs or handle dogs, someone will train you on that, or if you want to work with the cats, we'll train you there. Bunnies the same way. They're volunteers who do a lot of different functions around the shelter, but they're trained specifically to what their interest is. And I know you're looking to hire a volunteer coordinator. Uh, do we have any idea how many volunteers we have in the whole animal shelter system? Well, we've been working on our uh, logistics uh, database um, to, to make sure that we are archiving them appropriately and that, and that we know exactly how many we have. But, you know, at this point, the, the number is somewhere uh, probably between 3,500 and 5,000 names that have gone through. Now, are those all active right now? Probably not. 
but each, if you go to the shelters, some of the shelters, for example, if you go to East Valley, you'll usually find 10 or 12 volunteers there any time you stop in. Uh, I also see a lot of volunteers. I can talk about the shelters that I go to the most. <laughs> the, but the North Central, there's usually a, a number, a handful of volunteers there working on things. A lot of volunteers down at South LA. Uh, I believe the volunteer pool at West Valley is pretty strong as well. Um, Harbor, you know, almost owns their own community, so it's very um, heavily um, supported by the community and volunteers within the community. So the, most of the, what we need are uh, really specifics within the volunteer um, sort of realm. Uh, I feel like they need specific job descriptions. Uh, we need to rate people, for example, should they handle 80-pound uh, rambunctious dogs or should they handle the lap sitters. Uh, you know, we, we need for safety reasons to have a little bit more structure than what we have now. When I first arrived, there was a volunteer coordinator here. Um, he unfortunately had already accepted a job elsewhere, and that was when the budget uh, was so tight. So that position went away, and we weren't. We have been unable to have a volunteer coordinator in the last uh, six years. So, uh, but what I saw looking back at his program, uh, he had definitely, by having regular meetings with the shelters, working with the volunteers, working with the staff to work with the volunteers, he had definitely grown the program. And uh, do we have any kind of code of conduct or guidelines for volunteers? And if not, should we develop one? Well, um, if um, there have been over the last few years uh, since I've been here, there have been a few cases that the volunteer behavior was so bizarre that we've had to tell them they can't volunteer anymore. In some cases, we have suspended them and said, take a break, cool off, then let's talk about it. And in most cases, those volunteers have been reinstated. Okay. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Rue? <coughs> Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, um, on those line of questioning, we saw the report that was requested by the um, uh, adopted budget was just to ask for the number, I guess. The number, yeah. So do we have a, um, whether it's in personnel department or in, or whether it's in individual departments like a volunteer coordinator or some sort of um, uh, centralized office, it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the same line of questioning as the chairman put about do we have a um, what, what the uh, standardized um, 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 booklet for volunteers on what they can and can't do or anything like that? We have our own for the department. Right. We do have a volunteer handbook. But do we have one as an overall city? I, we'll have to look into that, but uh, I, I don't know if there is one or not. But we'll look into that. I have to get back to you on that. Yeah, to, excuse me. To my understanding, we don't. Um, I know each department is recruiting their volunteers differently. Uh -huh. So maybe that could be one of the questions that we redirect to them to see if right. we can possibly create a more standard one for citywide recruitment for volunteers. So that way they know where and how they can become one. So, so Mr. And Chair. If I could add, um, the mayor's office uh, had a, has a volunteer bureau and uh, they, they may have some additional information about how that intake mm -hmm. is done and what, um, you know, what, what information that they, they gather uh, may be part of a um, so uh, report Chair, back to. So, Mr. Chair, I'm very interested in this uh, um, initial report, and I'm very interested in volunteerism because obviously there's tons of people who want to volunteer, and I just feel that we're not properly utilizing. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, are, are, should we receive and file, or should we continue this, or... I, I think we probably should yeah. continue this and right. ask for uh, the general departments to report back and also to ask animal services to report back on whether there are further steps that you right. can take to provide better guidelines and coordination. So my staff will reach out to you to, you to um, with a couple more questions that you guys could include in your survey. Great. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, before we move on with that, however, um, we have uh, speakers Wayne Spindler, and that is it for this item. Oh. Notice on page 104, which is a chart, some two volunteers in the Department of Disability are working 1,172 hours. That means that two people in the Disability Department are volunteering 11 
uh, 12 hours a week? I mean, you know, I mean, you, you're working two people 12 hours a week the whole year without getting paid, volunteering for the disability department. I, you got to look into that. What the hell's going on there? Um, and the hours of work in the city attorney's office and the volunteers in the recreation and parks, you're not listing how many hours they're working. It's completely blank. That's outrageous. Because recreation and parks is different kind of work. A physical labor, somebody sprains their knee, somebody gets hurt, you know, you, you could be a disability claim. So, yes, they should be insured fully, and they should be provided medical care expenses if they get hurt, too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spindler. And so uh, we're going to hold this item in committee. What do you think a reasonable period of time would be for you to come back with all this information? 60 days would be good for us to gather information. Okay, so we will hear from you back in 60 days on this topic as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, item number five. Item number five, Housing Community Investment Department report relative to request for authority to implement an accessible living, accessible housing program in connection with the settlement agreement in Independent Living Center of Southern California, the City of Los Angeles et al. Good afternoon, Emily Zanservantes, Office of the CAO. Um, HCID is requesting various actions to implement an accessible housing program in connection with a settlement agreement with the Independent Living Center. Um, to meet the settlement agreement requirements and timeline, HCID and the CAO are requesting the following relevant recommendations. Uh, a resolution position authority for 17 positions in HCID and one resolution position authority within the city attorney. And in the Transmillan Joint Report, um, we wanted to be transparent in, uh, in letting Council uh, know that HC will be requesting uh, exemptions for a Chief Management Analyst to administer the entire program and a Senior Project Coordinator to oversee the Education and Outreach Team. The estimated cost for the fiscal year 16-17 is approximately $5.1 million. In the first uh, fiscal year 16-17, uh, financial status report. We set aside $3 million for the program. If additional resources are needed, the CAO will report back on funding options. And the department is also here to provi provide any additional background information and answer questions. Okay. Um, what will some of the first tasks be that are assigned to department staff once you staff up? Good afternoon. I'm Laura Guglamo. I'm the Executive Officer at the Housing and Community Investment Department. Um, w right now, I'm overseeing this program. It is uh, recently set the, in September, the Mayor and Council approved the settlement agreement with independent living centers and the other plaintiffs. We have very strict timelines for getting the program off the ground. One of the requirements, well, there are many requirements as part of the program, but overall the program requires that the city build new or retrofit over 4,000 rental um, apartments to make them accessible with the federal ADA standards. There's also um, new policies and procedures, uh, rental policies and procedures that all of our partner developers um, that, that are part of the settlement agreement have to uh, adopt as well as any new developments that are supported through city or federal funds, um, we will require that they adopt and that we will begin our um, uh, monitoring of these programs and um, ensuring that all of our property managers are made aware of the programs, that they adopt these policies in, in accordance with the settlement agreement timelines, and that they are, in fact, carrying them through. And there's training that will begin um, pretty much as soon as we can hire staff. Um, right now, we have, um, there's basically two of us um, <laughs> running this program, and we uh, don't have authority at this point to hire staff. So it's really important that we begin the hiring process as soon as possible because our timelines have really already started ticking. Some of the requirements are due as, as early as 60 and 90 days from the time the settlement agreement was adopted, which was the beginning of September. So we are really right up against it in terms of trying to get this program launched and off the ground. So You said, um, you, said you don't have authority to, uh, to actually hire the staff? That's what this transmittal is requesting. 
So we, the, the council adopted and approved the settlement agreement, but did not, um, the plan for implementing the program is included in our transmittal. So that's uh, really important to us in order to be able to implement this accessible housing program. So we um, really appreciate your support on that. And, the, and before you is the staffing requirement. So we are also absorbing um, several staff uh, within HSED's department. We're requesting substitute authorities to the CAO, but we don't have funding for that. So this transmittal includes the funding that we'll need to be able to support those staff. Have to do you this fill work. these through emergency appointments? There's only two, well, actually no emergency appointments. Um, there's two positions that we're requesting be exempt. Um, one is a chief management analyst. Um, it's a required position, is that not to be a chief management analyst, but a program administrator is required as part of the program. It'll be a high level position that will oversee all of the construction as well as the policies and the myriad of data um, data requests, um, uh, reporting requirements that are required as part of the program. We'll also report to um, an independent court monitor and the court to ensure that the city is in compliance. Um, that position would be exempt from civil service because of the highly specialized nature of, um, of the work. They should, the, the individual that's uh, selected should have some experience with the disabled community um, and the special requirements that, that they need, as well as construct, a construction background. So it's not your standard um, generic uh, management experience that you would get through the city process. And the other exempt position that we're requesting is for a project coordinator to really help who would be a specialist in um, the ADA and being able to uh, help us train our property managers. We're going to need to train over 3,000 individuals um, outside of the city of LA, the property managers, their own, the owners, and their employees, so that they understand um, what's required of them. It's quite extensive. And I think there's 17 new staff total that we're talking about? Well, we're, the program itself will, will begin with about 30 people, and we expect it to grow to be about 35, but we are only asking for new authorities for 17 positions for this fiscal year. We're going to, um, we've looked at our existing vacancies. We don't have funding for a lot of our positions. Um, HCID is almost exclusively funded through block grants, other grants, and special fees. We only have about three FTEs that are general funded. So, um, but we have seen a reduction in our block grant funding. So what we're proposing is to use some of those authorities to um, begin the hiring process so we're not, um, artificially expanding the size of the department, but we will need funding for that because this, they wouldn't be eligible for the um, grant funding that we do have available and that that's extremely limited. Um, but, but So the 17 would be 17 net new at this time, and then as part of the budget, we will be requesting that the positions that we, um, that we are absorbing, that they be reallocated from their existing classifications to the new proposed classifications, and we're working with the CAO's office to make that happen. Mr. Rue, any further questions or comments? Um, just a quick question. Um, retroactive um, sole source with, um, with the staffer um, from December 15th to June of 2017, why is that so? Um, you're referring to the agreement with Ms. Bauman. Ms. Bauman has been... Um, assisting the city and it's, this litigation has been going on for several years mm -hmm. and uh, she was part of a contract with a uh, outside attorney that the city has um, been using the work um, the contract her contract with that attorney had expired in December of 2015 we had been um, working with the CAO's office and the city attorney um, with the understanding that she was continuing to advise the city um, with in, in the area of the ADA and how the city's um, implementation plan and strategy in terms of how we would um, how would we how we would implement this program so um, it is unusual would... it's not something we would normally do it's um, it's something that so why was the contract not brought up in December 15th of 2015? 2015. We weren't 
the CAO issue. So there is a, I'll, I'll say that we were in the middle of litigation um, and HCID had made this, the use of Ms. Bauman's um, aware, we've made her, the use of her, uh, both the, the CAO, HCID, and the city attorney were all um, using the services of Ms. Bauman through this period of time and, and um, we did not have we did not yet know exactly that we didn't have a program to tell you that we were going to be implementing at that point because it was uh, very uncertain. Is there a time constraint for this item? Does it need to be passed today or? Uh, yes, um, and that this, we were actually really hoping that this whole program would go before the council went on recess, which obviously is not going to happen. Um, the settlement agreement has very strict time frames associated with it. We are already really behind the ball. So the, for example, the uh, program administrator position was supposed to be on board within 60 days. So I am acting in that capacity in order for the city to be in compliance with um, the settlement agreement. But I, I have other responsibilities to help run the, the Housing and Community Investment Department. And this is a very time-consuming program to get off the ground. I'm currently spending quite a bit of time trying to launch this program. It's really critical that we get our staffing in place so that we can meet all of the time, um, timelines. The training um, is supposed to begin. The policies are supposed to be implemented. and to our developers and we're, we're behind. We're behind schedule on this. We on are behind schedule. And I, and I don't want us to, um, I mean, this is a uh, implementation of a, of a lawsuit that we've settled, but um, so, but council's in recess now, so this won't go to council till after we come back. Correct. Um, I mean, do we, does the CAO here to answer that question? About I'm sorry, uh, what was the specific question? What will happen? Yeah, the um, retroactive. I mean, whenever I, whenever I see anything retroactive in sole source, I just have a. Um, I will have to actually get back to you on that one as to why uh, it was not addressed back in December. If the council, the committee wishes to move forward with this, maybe perhaps uh, that question could be answered before it goes to council. If you move the uh, report, we'd be happy to address forward. it that way. Okay. I'd be okay with that if I, that question and, and some of the sole source questions. So. Um, could, so we could. Um, uh, there are other sole source questions I can yeah. probably address today. So yeah, sole source for the court monitor, sole source for emphasis computer solutions. Is there a reason why we have to go into a sole source with them? Yes, um, the court monitor is under the settlement agreement. The city, in conjunction with the plaintiffs, um, need to go. Actually, within 60 days, so we're already late on that. But um, the the. The city and the independent, I'm um, sorry, and the plaintiffs are required to bring a um, mo independent monitor to go before, to be approved by the court. And the city, um, the the plaintiffs get to basically choose who the monitor okay, so is. The plaintiff so we don't we don't know who they are yet. Okay. Um, and there and the and the fee associated is outlined in the settlement agreement. But the oh, city so isn't. So court monitor isn't the name of the company. Court monitor is a court monitor. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah. It to be determined, court monitor. <laughs> capital M. So I thought it was the name of the. Okay, so that's. So, so there will be a sole source. Okay. It will be a sole source, and and it's that's not retroactive. It'll be you know whenever we can get approval to take that forward, and whoever that. Um, what about emphasis computer solutions? The reason we're recommending a sole source agreement with emphasis computer solutions is um, currently. Um, the city and the county have a joint partnership um, for a housing uh, database that allows folks to search for accessible house or sorry affordable housing. The settlement agreement requires that we expand um, that we have a database that includes all of the features that the current database has, but adds features for accessibility um, specifically. Um, we felt it would be much more efficient and um, to expand the existing database that exists um, that that emphasis has created and um, in order to meet that requirement as opposed to trying to build something from scratch so it's essentially uh, I'm guessing about 60 or 70 percent already in place and we would just be adding the additional features 
that would allow us to comply with the settlement agreement. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, I mean, um, if, since this is time sensitive and if you're okay with it, I don't mind passing it through to council, but I just, for the record, I do have concerns. I mean, I'm, anytime there's a sole source or a retroactive, I'm going to... It's, yeah. it's a legitimate but, issue. It's not something that, um, it's definitely outside the norm. But my staff will follow up. Yeah, I was going to say if we could ask your staff to follow up with Mr. Rue we'll be happy before to. it comes to council, um, that would be good. Um, Mr. Spindler, I wonder if the, in the interest of time, if you'd like to waive your time so we can do public comment fully. Oh, you want to do general public comment? Yeah. Okay. I'll waive if we can skip this, that would Okay, I'll skip it. So thank you. We will uh, approve those recommendations from the CAO and HCID and uh, ask you to follow up with Mr. Rue's office on those questions. We'll be happy to. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Now we have public comment, uh, beginning with um, Mr. Spindler. So on um, this thing, we just aforementioned, it's a complete disaster. Good news, it's not your fault. This was done in a rush to get a settlement and they had the best plaintiff's attorneys. They scared the hell out of Paul Koretz. They went down in budget and finance right in this room. I, t I told them the attorneys were gonna rape the city and, and I just said, okay, you guys are so smart, I'm so stupid. Give them the $200 million. And they put this all in here. They never told you guys. So you got this bomb dropped on you. And you're going to have to repair this damage. In the first year, they're only going to give $3 million. They have to average $20 million a year to comply with this 10-year settlement. This is a disaster. I predict you're not going to make it. This is going to be a failed settlement agreement. God help us. So, But there's nothing you can do but just give these, these, these crooks the money, and for that, we're all sorry. Thank you. Phyllis Doherty, to be followed by Dan Gus, who will be our last speaker for the meeting. Phyllis Doherty, thank you for uh, taking public comment. I want you to know that uh, during this last week, uh, one of our animal controls officers was attacked uh, on a property where he went, the, reportedly the dog had already attacked. It's a pit bull. And it got, uh, his, he was backed against a wall. He was a uh, um, catch bull. There was a problem with it. The dog got his arm, took him down, split the back of his head open as he hit a rock. This is what Mrs. Barnett's not telling you. And this is happening all the time. These officers don't even, by the way, this officer is so good, as he, as he came, became conscious again, he lost consciousness, the dog was over him, which is the way dogs do, and they think they've got you, and that's it. And he managed to wrestle the dog and still capture it with that wound and with the situation with his head. One thing I want to tell you, they do not get debriefing or any kind of counseling when they go through these. Animal control pays no attention. Mrs. Barnett has paid no attention. They need the same opportunity that our police officers have after these. I just want to tell you one more thing. This dog had been transported here, apparently from Illinois. The microchip read that it came from an Illinois rescue group. It had already had a history of biting. Thank you. Daniel Gus, um, regarding credible information about fraud by best friends, all you have to do is pull up the emails. You store the emails. You know the emails from Nicole Schwartzlander of Best Friends. So if your on-the-record statement is that there's no credible information, I'm going to address that in at least a half dozen articles between now and the primary for City Council CD5. Uh, so you can call it not credible if you want. You know who the email is from. You'll be able to find out who the email is to. And I have the information here. Ignore it at the cost to your campaign. We'll leave it at that. Now, maybe Mr. Rue doesn't know this. I've had communications with a former shelter veterinarian named Dr. Goldman, who has documentation that the man who was sitting here, the assistant GM, Louis Dado, has been keeping his own personal animals in the city shelter. Dr. Goldman provided me photos, not just of the animals, but the animals in filthy conditions. I suggest you, you investigate. Thank you. And with no further business before us, we are adjourned.